Now, you, bless you adults, I don't, want, I don't want to see you bringing bow and arrows and your kids' toys in here and just trying to prove pastor wrong or, uh, you know, this is not the place to do any of that. But it is a message that rings true for every single one of us, isn't it? There's not a thing that you and I can do to make right with God. But praise God, Jesus Christ took care of that on the cross. Amen? You know, in the, <clears throat> it's interesting. You can look up on script, or, or you can look in Scripture and find things. But you can look up on, on the Internet and you can find all kinds of things. Do you know there is a list that you can look up and find of famous last sayings? You're thinking, well, who would even, well, I did, but it pertained to Scripture today. It, it, it pertained to, to the, the account, the text that we read, but it was interesting, some of these fam- that, they, that are considered famous last words. Karl Marx said this, Last words are for fools who haven't said enough. I wonder if he was rethinking his last words. Joan Crawford, don't don't you dare ask God to help me. I'm wondering if she's rethinking her words. Leonardo da Vinci, I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. Winston Churchill, before going into a coma the last nine days of his life, said, I'm bored with it all. Mozart said this, I feel something that is not of this earth. I wonder if he has a more concrete answer now. Steve Jobs. Oh, wow, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Edgar Allan Poe, Lord, help my poor soul. Voltaire, after being asked by a priest to to renounce Satan, said this, now is not the time for making new enemies. I wonder if Voltaire would, would really like another chance to change his last words. Just wondering. Jane Austen said this, I want nothing but death. And we read these and some, you you, you sense an aching of the soul. Some, you you really, (laughs) you feel sorry for them. You wish that they have had another chance to, to say something else to be their last words. You read words like this and you know exactly where they're at right now. And and it's enough to make your hearts break knowing that there are those that had some idea about life only to be totally wrong. You know where they're spending their eternity. Last words speak loud about that particular person. This message this morning isn't about what your last words will be, but it does affect that. But I want us, as we continue this this thought of words from the cross, I want us to consider Jesus' last words. Six hours, in a span of six hours on the cross, Jesus speaks seven hours different words seven words seven phrases that are packed with so much meaning and so much hope not for him but for us words that many times we we take for granted Last week, we, as we studied, started this series, we looked at, Father, forgive them because they, don't know, they know not what they do. Folks, that is a major thing for you and I. Father, 
forgive them because they have no clue what they're doing. Not that he's okay in sin. That we, man doesn't know the ramifications of their choices. And Jesus is pleading on their behalf. Even though they realize that's not what, they, even though they, real, they don't realize what they really need. But then there's another phrase I want us to look at, another word that I want us to look at today. And it's this. Verily I say unto you, today you shall be with me in paradise. As Jesus is speaking this, Jesus is being mocked Jesus is being ridiculed because he's not saving himself. The, the Pharisees, the crowd, the, the high priests are saying, if you are truly God, save yourself. You've claimed it. You're going to tear things down in three days. Uh, let's see it happen. And there is ridicule going on at this moment. He is being mocked. And as he's being mocked because he's not saving himself, but talking about saving others, there's two criminals on the cross, crosses. We're not just talking about petty thief guys. These are lifestyle criminals, hardened criminals, armed robbery type of thieves. Thieves that are probably willing to kill to not be found, to take care of business. I mean, the, the, you talk about a rap sheet. These guys had it all. One on each side of Jesus. Jesus being in the middle. They had devoted their lives to thievery, to mayhem. I think you could look at these two men and these exemplified that bad, deep to the bone wickedness. You could look at these two men and, and, and just they were the epitome of, of the depravity of man. They were as broken, as wicked, as bad, as evil as, as you could possibly get. And Jesus was in the middle of both of these guys. Father, forgive them because they have no clue what they're doing. Verily, I say unto you, you will be with me in paradise. What happened from Father, forgive them to you will be with me in paradise. In a short amount of time, there was a response. There were, was responses that, that took place. And that's what I want us to look at in our text this morning. Three responses. You see, as Jesus is being ridiculed, as Jesus is being scorned, as Jesus is being laughed at, as they are being nailed to the cross, guess what? We find in Scripture that these things, these very ones, these criminals, as they are hanging, as they are being nailed, guess what? They are taking part in this same ridicule. I mean, this is how insane and how crazy, if you are being nailed to a cross, Would ridiculing a guy next to you be the thing that's on your mind? I'll be honest, I'd be thinking, man, this really hurts. In my mind, I'd be thinking, I don't know how, much, how, how long I, I, I can, can last. Oh boy, that, that's a lot of blood. 
And, but yet these guys we see in Scripture aren't talking about this, but the criminals are being <coughs> pardon me, crucified along with Jesus. Turn all their attention to Jesus. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 44, or pardon me, sorry, in verse 39, and they had passed by, reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If you be the Son of God, now come down from the cross. Likewise, also the, the chief priests mocked him with the scribes and the elders said, He saved others himself, and himself he cannot save. If he be king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now. If if he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. Look at verse 44. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in their teeth, said the same thing, ridiculed the same person. They weren't talking about themselves. Their attention was on the one that was crucified next to them. If they can ridicule him and, and <coughs> pardon me, hurl insults from where they're standing, we're going to do it right here hanging on the cross. That is brokenness and wickedness and evil to the core. But it's not just Matthew. In, in Mark chapter 15 and verse 32, And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Oh, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest in three days, save thyself. And come down from the cross. Likewise, all the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others. Himself, he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. They that were crucified with Jesus mocked him. Hanging on that cross. Experienced in their cruciating, excruciating pain that is going through. Suffering the same as, as Jesus was suffering. And their attention was on Jesus. Ridiculing him. Hurling insults at him. Yet in that moment, in that period of time, when all of that, from, from them to the, the two thieves, chiming in, throwing in their insults, I don't think they carefully chose their words. I mean, I think they most likely used the most evil language, that you could think of. As they're ridiculing Jesus, I'm pretty sure they're cursing Jesus. Yeah, something happens. A change begins to take place. A response to who Jesus is takes place. That is what we see. I want us to look at this first response, and it's this. From one of the thieves, the first is this. If you are Christ, save yourself and us. The text says that he railed on him. That word rail is Femio, which means to revile or, or to blaspheme or, or to slander. At that moment, wasn't some, he wasn't hanging there on, the, on his cross and Jesus hanging on his cross. And you know what? I'm just going to hurl some names. You know, you're ugly. You don't have no hair. You're, you're fat. You're skinny. You're... It wasn't those type of insults. It was blasphemy. It was slander that, that was hurled at 
Jesus. If you are Christ, save yourself and us. Hey, if you can get on the cross, get us off the cross. Why? So I can go back and I continue living the life that I have been thinking I'm enjoying. I want to get off this place to go back to what I know. Here's an example of an unregenerate heart. One that could care less about who Jesus is and what Jesus wanted to do for him. Paul writes about the unregenerate heart. As it is written, there are none righteous, no, not one. There is none that do, understand it. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. And look how Paul uh, describes it. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of, of cursing and bitterness. This is the thief that Paul is describing their feet are swift to shed blood destruction and misery are in their <coughs> pardon me, are in their ways in the way of peace they have not known there is no fear of god before their eyes that's the first thief on the cross that's his response if you are truly jesus you come down off that cross. Get me and my companion off of the cross so that we can go back and do what we've been doing. Folks, listen. Nothing has changed today. Man still slanders and blasphemes God. If you are truly God, you do this in my life. If you are truly God, give me this. They say, if you are truly God, do this, and I will believe. No, they won't. How many works did Jesus do in his lifetime to prove who he was and who he is and who he will be, and they still didn't follow him? Coming off a cross isn't going to change the fact. He had already raised people from the dead. What's more, what's more difficult, raising some from the dead or becoming unnailed on a cross and get down and go on your life. But we see today the slander that it goes against the name of God. And because of that, there is no belief in God. There is no honoring God and the things that pertain to God. Just think, I mean, there is a time where we've mentioned this. The church building was off limits. You may not go to church. You may not attend church, but listen, that was an honorable thing. You would not mess with it. God's word was an honorable thing. It was held in high regard. Folks, there are people today that could care less what God's word says. It's just a book that's filled with myths and old stories. And their response is the same as it was with this thief if you are jesus do this for me that's the first response but as i said earlier from the time jesus is praying father forgive them for they know not what they do someone was noticing jesus Because look what the response number two. There was another thief. And he said this. But the other thief answering, rebuking, he didn't rebuke Jesus. This change that took place, it says that, that the other answering rebuked him, rebuked the other criminal, saying, don't you fear God, seeing you are in the same condemnation? 
we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. That's what a miss is. This man has done nothing wrong. How did that criminal know that Jesus had done nothing wrong? You tell a lot about the, char- about the man by the character that he is. In that short amount of time, they, they were probably cussing the soldiers as they were nailing them to the, to the beams. As they were, well, as the crosses were, were put into place, they were cussing and, 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 and insults. But he watched how Jesus conducted himself. He was probably, probably in close proximity to here as they were hurling insults, as they were nailing Jesus to the cross, as they were raising up, Father, forgive them. In this mind, this criminal's like, you know what? This man is totally different. I bet you in his mind, he's thinking, you know, me and my companion on the other side of Jesus, we were all about wrecking lives. We were all about hurting and, and, and you know as long as we benefited and here's this man and his heart is coming out into prayer these that are that are nailing him remember everything that jesus has already gone through he is beyond recognition and he was thinking about others And as he talks to the thief, he then turns his attention to Jesus. Isn't it amazing what happens when we turn our attention to Jesus? He said unto Jesus, Lord, Lord, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, Lord, it wasn't any other, Lord. What did he mean? Jesus, you are the one who you say you are, Lord. Remember me. He acknowledged Jesus as God. And animal, he had come into fear of God and, and his judgment. We get this same picture uh, of the publican in Luke chapter 18 and verse, <clears throat> verse 13. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And what did Jesus say? I tell you this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Father, be merciful to me, a sinner. This response, the second response Totally different from the first one. In this response, the the criminal confessed that he was guilty. And he deserved the punishment. Folks, before man can be saved, he must understand that he's guilty. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This man realized, listen, we deserve what we're getting. He went from railing to, you know what, yes, I'm guilty. He can realize that Jesus was not guilty. He understood Jesus to be Lord. Remember me when what? You come into your kingdom. Just 
Just remember me. I'm here on the cross. I, I, I deserve this. I, I am this criminal. I am getting justice. But Jesus, you don't deserve this. You are the Lord. You are God. And when you come into your kingdom, remember, how did he know about that? But remember me. Listen, this criminal was in an utterly hopeless situation. He wasn't getting off that cross. In a short amount of time, he was going to die. There was an eternity before him. And he asked for just a small ounce of mercy. Just remember me. Nothing more. Just Jesus when, when, when you get it, come into your kingdom, will you remember me? Will you think about me? Just remember. His response was one of confession. His, his response was one of realization. His response was one of that was at the mercy of Jesus. Two different responses. One that, that blasphemed Jesus. One that acknowledged Jesus. But there's an even better response in this text. There's a third response. Verily, I say unto you, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. I like what Tony Evans says, Pastor Tony Evans, when he's preaching and he comes across the text, especially here in the New Testament, where we see, read the word verily, or many times it's verily, verily. Tony Evans says this, for sure, for sure. Jesus is saying to this criminal, for sure, I say unto you, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. You notice Jesus doesn't say, for sure, I'll remember you. All right, you're a criminal, I I'm going to keep you on the outskirts, but, but I'll remember you. What does Jesus say? For sure, you will be with me. You will be in my presence with me. Not as an afterthought, but in the present. You will be with me in paradise today. This cursed criminal who the Jews viewed as unredeemable was promised entrance into the kingdom of God. In their eyes, this was outrageous. Folks, this is outrageous today. Because we still look at people and say, you know what? You don't deserve Jesus. You've done this or you've done that. Listen, it doesn't matter to Jesus. His response is the same. When you come to him, you acknowledge him, you confess your sins, today you will be with Jesus in paradise. It doesn't matter who. These are great words, aren't they? Encouraging words. Today you'll be with me in paradise. He didn't say, I'll remember you, but he said, you'll be with me. You'll have a position with me. When Jesus said that he would be with him in paradise, Jesus wasn't talking about no purgatory. There's no such thing. He didn't say, oh, today you'll be in purgatory. No, he said, you'll be with me. He didn't say that you're, you're not going to have to do works for righteousness. And you have to be nailed on the cross. No, he said, you will be with me. I'm taking care of this. As Jesus is talking to the criminal, Jesus is taking his sin on his shoulders. Think about that. You're not having to do works for, purg or for righteousness. You're not going to purgatory. Jesus doesn't tell him, listen, sorry, you're only half saved. You have to be baptized. 
No. What did Jesus say? You've acknowledged me as Lord. You will be with me in paradise. This isn't just a one-time example and everything else changes. No. This is what justification looks like to, to the uttermost. You will be with me in paradise. Why? Because the sins, that, the, the blood that I'm shedding right now, the sins that I'm going to be taking on my shoulders is the price being paid. Folks, this part has to be one of the greatest examples of justification in Scripture. In the very essence, in our mind, one that does not deserve anything matter of fact he was speaking blasphemy at the very beginning towards jesus you know that word justification is one that we hear about we talk about oh that's that's a church that's a bible word but from time to time we need to be reminded of the deepness of these bible words Justification is like this. There's a story of a man in England who put his Rolls Royce on a boat and went across to the continent to go on a holiday. And while he was driving around Europe, boy, doesn't that sound like a nice trip? How many would love to get on a, on a, on a, a car and just drive? I would love to do that in Europe. But he drove around in Europe. But something happened to the motor of his car, and he, he, caught, he cabled. He sent a message to the Rolls Royce people back in England and asked, I'm having trouble with my car. What do you suggest that I do? Well, the Rolls Royce per people said, <clears throat> We'll send someone. They flew a mechanic over to where this man was. The mechanic repaired the car, flew back to England, and left the man to continue his holiday. And can you imagine the confusion on this man's, in this man's mind as he was wondering, I wonder how much this is going to cost me. Isn't that the first question that we ask ourselves? So when he got back to England, he wrote the people a letter and asked, how much did he owe? He received a letter back from the Rolls Royce office that said, dear sir, there is no record anywhere in our files that anything ever went wrong with a Rolls Royce. Folks, that's justification. The car did break down. The car did have issues. But when he got back and got this letter, it was as if this car, hey, there, there's never issues with a Rolls Royce. Folks, that's how God looks at you and me. It's not that we don't have issues. Oh, man, we come to church. We all have. We probably have so many issues going on right now. We have so many issues. If we weren't worried about what people thought right now, probably a good thing would be to call Tommy to come up here and start an invitation. And we just come and li line up at this altar and we just lay out all of our issues before God. We have those kind of issues and those problems. But when we have the blood of Jesus covering us, God looks at us and sees, you know what? That's Jesus' blood. There is no issues when it comes to Jesus' blood. Jesus' blood accomplishes what it sets out to accomplish. To wash us white as snow. That's the response that Jesus gives, you will be with me in paradise. They were word, they were prom, uh, this promises were words of full forgiveness. When he says paradise, listen, it's not trying to figure out what is paradise. I've sat around fellowship tables with preachers and, we, and different ones, and we talk about, you know, what is actual paradise? Listen, all paradise is, it's a picture of full reconciliation with Jesus. Being with Jesus, wherever, wherever Jesus is, guess what? That's paradise. Because nothing else compares. He was still suffering unspeakable physical torment. 
but the misery of his soul was now gone. For the very first time in his life, he was free from the burden of sin. If what Jesus said today, you will be with me in paradise, he's probably saying, oh, I hope this death thing really comes on quick because I got something good to look forward to. As believers, we can say, listen, we say, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. For the first time, man, I get to be with Jesus. As the thief was hanging there, the Savior next to him bearing his sins. As that thief was hanging, he was being clothed with Jesus' perfect righteousness. You have the response of the first one. If you're really Jesus, get yourself down, and while you're at it, get me down. You have the second one realize, you know what? <laughs> Remember me in paradise. Remember me when you're in your kingdom. Then you have Jesus. For sure. I promise you will be with me today. You don't have to wait. When this is over on this cross, you will be with me in paradise. Jeff Strand is a pastor in Evansville, Indiana, and few years ago he was called to visit a 93 year old man who had terminal cancer his name was Adolf Allen he'd been lived and Adolf had lived this hard living hard drinking he was a, a union iron worker for most of his life he was just this gruff rough man and two minutes into their conversation Adolf looked at at Jeff and asked is it fair for someone to live their whole life one way and then at the end of their life to ask God to take them to heaven? And after uh, thinking for a moment, Jeff said, no, Adolf, it's not fair. But luckily for you and, and me, God is not fair. And in that moment, Jeff shared the plan of salvation with them and, and this 93-year-old man bowed his head confessed his sins and asked Jesus to come into his heart. You see, four weeks later, Jeff talk, talks about how he, how he preached Adolf's funeral. And at that funeral, he talked about how some football games come down to the, the final play. There might have been a team that has been behind the whole game, from start to all the way to almost the finish. They have been behind, scrapping the whole game. But on that last play, that last play, time may be ticking away. The quarterback goes, and he, he heaves up a Hail Mary. They may have been gone, been behind all game long, but, but that last moment, that Hail Mary goes up, and somehow, some way, that ball falls into that receiver's arms as he is falling into the end zone. And guess what? It doesn't matter if they were trailing the whole game. It doesn't matter if you think it's fair or not. Guess what? That receiver scored that winning touchdown with no time left. And many times, that's just exactly what Jesus does. Was it fair that this thief lived all his life? In our eyes, no, it's not fair that he can live whichever way and then be hanging on a cross and then, oh, he gets to be with Jesus in paradise? I don't know about you, but I'm glad that Jesus doesn't deal in fairness. But he deals in righteousness. And he deals in hope. 
and he deals in mercy. <laughs> because as long as there's still a, cl- a second on the clock, there's still opportunity. <laughs> Remember me when you come into my kingdom. For sure, you will be with me in paradise. What a word of hope. That Jesus, as he's on the cross, we put our faith and trust in him. It doesn't matter if we're young or old or in between. If we truly put our faith and trust in him, you will be with me in paradise. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord. We thank you for your word. Lord, the the encouragement from your word, the power that's in your word, the hope that we receive from your word. Lord, as we look at this account, we're just, we're the exact same as the criminals on the cross. We deserve to be on the cross. We deserve the punishment. But yet we see two responses. Lord, I thank you that you don't just throw us away. But as long as there's a breath, you give us a chance. Lord, I thank you for your grace and your mercy. We stand condemned to die. But by your grace through faith. We can be saved. And Lord, I thank you this morning for saving me. And Lord, those that are here this morning that have put their faith and trust in your son Jesus, I thank you for their salvation. But Lord, if there's one here this morning, maybe they are sitting here this morning and they truly have never put their faith and trust in Jesus, Lord, I pray for the ones that may be watching this live stream Or maybe watching it later on, Lord, if they've never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that they would be like criminal number two. Realizing you are who you say you are. That they would confess Jesus as Lord. Finding forgiveness of their sins. That's what life is all about. And Lord, that's what you have called us to do is to go and proclaim that very message. Lord, I pray that a movement would begin. May we see lives changed because their faith has been placed in Jesus. May your spirit have his way today as we Pray these in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. I'm going to ask you to please stand.